Okay. okay. I don't see if we're on the screen. Can um, you see us? That, can you see us? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. Um, I'm the program director for the MED program. I, I think I know most of you. Could, maybe we could just go around and everybody could say their names and how they're connected with our work. Can we do that? Okay. Briefly. Should we start in Tucson? Sure. Good. Can they see us all? Yeah. Because I, I can't I see everyone. In. I think I zoomed in on too close, but I'll come right over here. I'm Maria. Um, I'm Maria. Hi. I'm Maria Orozco. I'm the clinical practice coordinator for Pima uh, in Santa Cruz County and uh, work closely with some placement with our fast track students and some assistance with our alternative pathway uh, students year one. That's me. Thanks, Maria. I'm Louis Gomez. I'm with uh, UA South Secondary Mentor in Pima County. Thanks, Louis. Hi. Hi, I'm Jeff Sommerfeld and UA South, and I'm a university mentor as well. I'm currently helping out in Pima County, also have some ties in Cochise County. Can you see if I'm sitting here? I can see we you can't see. We, we can't see our own pro projection. It's hard on Rick. It's really you hard. It's really hard. <laughs> um, uh, Rick Orozco, uh, Assistant Professor of Secondary Ed. I'm Curtis Acosta. I'm an assistant <laughs> professor in uh, uh, language and culture and education, and uh, today I'll be playing the part of the remote control for Rick. Ah. So that's why you won't see me in the camera shot. I'm over here pushing buttons. Okay. Uh, that's Santa all we Cruz? have here. Is that okay? What about Santa Cruz? Uh, I'm Mark Valenzuela, and uh, I'm a university mentor, and I do usually elementary ed. But uh, I've had some alternate path MED students. Good afternoon. My name is Alana Aguirre. I'm the student services coordinator for our, uh, Santa Cruz location. I don't work as directly with the secondary students, but uh, I do get inquiries. So I'm curious to learn anything that I can. Thank you. Thank you. Allison, what about you? Oh. <laughs> So engaged in all the things I'm Ellen Barrett, teacher education coordinator, and uh, we are. We'll carry on. Um, there was another event for superintendents, and um, Sharon will be over as soon as she can get here. So, hi, I'm Maru Mendez. I'm one of the Fobesi Escola. Um, I work at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. Nice to see you. Thanks, Maru. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so as I said, I'm Meta Kralovic. I'm the program director uh, for the MED program. And again, thank you all for being here. I just wanted to say very briefly that we, we developed this equity literacy series um, as a result of changing the conceptual framework for the MED program. And uh, we spent a couple of years doing that, Rick and Curtis and I, um, over the course of those two years, did a major redesign to that conceptual framework, and then we realized that we needed to provide training for our mentors so that there was more of an alignment between the conceptual framework, the coursework that our students were doing, and the uh, coaching they were getting in the field. So this is the last of the three-part series, and Rick Orozco is my colleague in the MED program, and will, um, share with us today his uh, perspective on equity literacy. Is that enough of a, an introduction? Rick is a U of A grad, so, okay. We also have one other join. join. Oh, who is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, Douglas. Uh -huh. Oh, that's, is that, who is that? Looks like he's, he's he's probably he's Yeah. Like he's oh. Okay. All right, so let's I'll, share, I'll maybe we can get started. Yeah, I'll go and get started. Um, so um, in this in this reconceptualization that we we went through starting gosh a couple of summers ago, um, we talked about the necessity of 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 bringing more criticality to 
what it is that we do um, to try to help uh, the students that come through our programs to be able to go into the classroom and essentially do, do the work, really, that the Mexican-American Studies teachers were doing in, at, at TUSD because uh, we, we knew that they were having uh, success uh, in uh, student outcomes, uh, student graduation rates, and, and so forth. And, we, and, and for me, anyway, I, I wanted to try to replicate what it was that they were doing. Can we teach our teachers to do what they were doing? So uh, it was really fortunate that we were able to have Curtis join us um, because he, he's able to kind of bring clarity to precisely how it is that they were able to achieve what they were doing. One of the things that subsequent to that that I came across was this notion of equity literacy. And although they didn't call it this at TUSD, it, it appears to me that this is precisely what they were doing. Um, and, and, I, and I'll try to lay out how that looks um, before we leave here um, in about 50 minutes or so. But equity literacy then is this idea that we need to do something more um, to help our students to be able to understand uh, how it is that the world has, has had an effect on them. And then also for our teachers to understand how it is that they may be able to uh, offset some of that or drop on it if needed. So that's kind of where we're going uh, with equity literacy. Um, Paul Gorski is the person, uh, the scholar, that kind of writes about equity literacy the most. And there was a couple of, of quotes that he put out not too long ago. Um, the first one is, there's no path to justice that does not involve a direct confrontation with injustice. So if what we're trying to do is bring some sort of equitable experience to all students, then what we need to do, and, and, and maybe another name of, uh, that we can call it is justice, to what's going on in our classrooms, then the only way that we're going to achieve that is to directly confront injustice. And this is a concept that is not new to, or not uh, only something that is done in schooling. Obviously, civil rights leaders uh, did this. Um, they, they directly uh, addressed injustice as part of their move to create justice. So that's kind of where, where we want to go with this. And the second quote is, equity initiatives must focus not on fixing marginalized people, but on fixing conditions that marginalize people. So if we're thinking about students, what he's suggesting is that we shouldn't be looking at ways to fix our students. They're not really broken. However, they come into an institution that oftentimes is, and that institution is what we call schooling. So we need to figure out ways of fixing the conditions of schooling to help our students uh, get this equitable experience that we all want them to have. All right, so Gorski defines or conceptualizes equity literacy this way, and I think we've kind of all seen this before, but um, he states that there are three parts to it, um, the recognize, respond, and redress conditions. And what I'm going to be focusing on today is the recognize part. We can spend, it would take a lot longer than one hour to, to try to uh, analyze and come to grips with all three of these. So I'm going to spend the first 50 minutes, or, or the only 50 minutes that we have, on the recognize part, because we can't do anything with respond or redress if we're not able to recognize. And so um, I'm going to spend uh, my time today talking about this recognition piece. And what it is that we need to be able to recognize are those things that occur that deny equal or equitable access to all students in the classroom. And then those, uh, those access points will mediate the outcomes, and I'll, and I'll show how that works in just a little bit. But this is precisely what Gorski is talking about. So if we can recognize, respond, and redress the conditions that create inequities, then we should be able to mediate positively the outcomes of the students in the classroom. So let me show just very briefly what some of these outcomes are, just so that we all understand the necessity for this, right? What are these outcomes? And, and we can show a whole bunch of different things. But in this slide, what I wanted to show are graduation rates uh, from 1970 to 2010, and this comes from the Census Bureau of 2012. And what we can see is, is, is that an incremental increase among all the groups here. So all groups have, uh, have increased their graduation rates. But if we look at the 
proportion of the populations of each population uh, and their graduation rates, what we see is, is a continuing disparity. So what this is telling us is while there are some good things that are going on in classrooms that lead to increased graduation rates, there are still some barriers for some students in our schooling systems. And equity literacy, I believe, is one of the things that's going to help us to be able to recognize those things so that we can address them and, and fix them. So again, although you know from, 20, uh, from 1970 to 2010, there's been an increase in the graduation rates of eth Mexican ethics in the United States, it still lags way behind that of their African-American peers and, of course, their, their white peers. So a lot of the students that we'll be dealing with in our region are Mexican ethnic students, and so it's, it's imperative that we understand the outcomes of, of these experiences that they're having uh, in their schooling. Several years ago, to try to understand these outcomes, uh, there was, uh, well, it's actually just a year ago, um, there was a, an, an article that was published by uh, Levy and her colleagues um, that essentially asked the question, how can psychophysiological conditions related to race or ethnicity or any other social characteristic mediate the way that students' uh, outcomes uh, from school appear? So this piece uh, wanted to try to understand how it is that stress that is based on race or ethnicity in, in, in this precise case, how do those stressors mediate outcomes like those we just saw uh, in terms of graduation rates? In their piece, what they do is they talk about uh, per, uh, perceived discrimination in terms of student perceptions and the effects of those uh, perceptions on their schooling. So not only is this perception coming from schools, it's coming from a larger society. So it's not just schools that are putting out information that students are perceiving as discriminatory. That being said, schools are doing it as well. So as, as schools as a larger, as, as a part of a larger society, need to be able to recognize how it is that they are sending these messages that students are perceiving as discriminatory. Well, that in and of itself is, is problematic, but let's try to understand, according to Levy and her colleagues, how precisely this works. So perceived discrimination has an effect on, uh, a negative effect on emotions. Uh, so anxiety, anger, stress, etc., are three emotions that are negatively affected by, by students' perceptions of discrimination. And a little bit later in, in this presentation, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some research that myself and, and Dr. Lopez, who was here last month, uh, were able to do uh, that kind of shows this in terms of our local community. But when these in negative emotions happen, when anxiety, anger, stress, et cetera, occur, biologically there is an effect. And, and, and again, this is just to show how it is that this uh, has an effect. These uh, emotions increase what is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which means that there are um, uh, signals that are sent out. There are uh, chemicals that are released from our brains that have an effect on our bodies. And this chemical, specifically in the case of the HPA axis, is cortisol. And cortisol is responsible for mediating or controlling among other things, blood pressure and respiration, right? So if we are having uh, issues with high blood pressure and high respiration, what we know is that there's going to be decreased cognitive function. This is something that happens biologically to us. And in terms of students' engagements in school, what that means is they could experience uh, issues with, the, with respect to attention in the classroom, memory with respect to what teachers are telling them, and so forth. In addition, uh, negative emotions create changes in the quality and the amount of hours one is able to rest. You know, hopefully not too many of us have dealt with this, but if we're human beings, we've dealt with this. We know that negative emotions can impose upon our sleep habits, right? Cause us to lose sleep, um, and even if we do get sleep, it may, we may be waking up because of anxiety and, and so forth. And those uh, responses in our sleep also uh, have an effect on our cognition. So if we're talking about students, 
then these two things in conjunction with one another can be really problematic for them uh, in the classroom. And then teachers uh, might respond because they don't understand, perhaps, that these uh, biological responses are occurring and then blame the students for not being engaged, blame, blame the students for not caring, et cetera, et cetera. So again, what, what's important about this is that we understand that there's a, there's truly is a biological response that causes these kinds of, of things to happen to our students. So Levy and her uh, associates talk about ways to what they call buffer um, these responses. So, and so I'm calling them coping mechanisms. Um, but they talk about five different ways to cope. Uh, the first is positive socialization uh, for parents and, and so forth. Uh, community social capital, drawing on that, uh, the strengths that the communities ha have to offer uh, to help the students to be able to cope with some of these uh, biological disturbances. Uh, smaller school size, uh, again, this is nothing that teachers often have a whole lot of control of, right? But the fourth and fifth, perhaps, might be places where teachers can have an effect uh, on students in terms of being able to cope with these biological uh, responses to perceived discrimination. The first is increased uh, group identification. And this is part of what culturally sustaining pedagogies is all about. And I think uh, Dr. Costa can speak much more to uh, what culturally sustaining pedagogy precisely does. Uh, but part of what it does is that it helps students to be able to uh, not just see themselves in curriculum, but also reinforces in a positive way their culture, their lived experience, um, and so forth. So, so that we are, in some way, sustaining the strengths that they have when they come into, the, into our classrooms. right? And then the last that Levy and her uh, 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 colleagues talk about is this perceived teacher support. So this perception by students that the teachers are there to support them. And there are many ways that this can be shown, and one of those ways is what we'll be talking about today in terms of equity literacy. So how is it that teachers can support students to be able to cope with the stressors that they feel on a daily basis not just from within the school, but also from society as a whole, because they're coming into classrooms as, as people that have been affected by larger social conditions. So equity literacy is asking us to, to help students to be able to cope with some of these issues that they might have when they come into the classroom. All right, so equity literacy then is asking us several, several things. You can click it one more time. One more time. Yeah. Um, and the first bullet, and again, I think all of you have, maybe have seen this. I, I think it's kind of part of this um, equity literacy uh, introduction worksheet. Um, part of this, and, and what I'm going to focus on today, are the abilities of teachers to recognize how these subtle biases occur in materials and everyday interactions between teachers and students. Because remember, Schools and, and what goes on in classrooms are not solely responsible for the perceived discriminations that students feel. However, what we do in the classroom can either, either address or it can reinforce those discriminations and those anxieties that students feel when they come into the classroom. So equity literacy wants us to be able to recognize what those things are so that we can address them with our students so that they feel some sense, at least, of relief some sense of teacher support, as the previous slide showed, um, so that students uh, are able, ultimately, to engage in school in, in a more productive way for themselves. So um, it also wants teachers to be able to know uh, people in their content disciplines and how it is that they use uh, kind of this uh, indigenous knowledge, and, and indigenous not in terms of Native Americans, but indigenous in terms of what it is that people bring to their their particular experience and, and be able to build on those things in the classroom. In a lot of places, this is called funds of knowledge. Um, I think uh, hopefully sustaining pedagogies is asking us to do that same kind of work and move beyond it as well. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about that as well. And then the last thing, of course, is for teachers to be able to reject uh, deficit views. But we can't reject deficit views 
unless we can recognize what those deficit views are and how it is that they show themselves in the classroom. So it's one thing to say, yeah, we're going to reject the deficit views that society holds about uh, Mexican ethnic students in the classroom. But if we're not able to recognize, number one, what those views are, and secondly, how it is that we might perpetuate them, even unconsciously, then we're not going to be able to uh, fix those things uh, that the institution is putting out that could cause or reinforce the anxieties that students are having. So I'm going to be talking about, and, and kind of the title of, of, of this presentation was a discursive necessity. And so I want to talk about discourse in a couple of different ways. Um, in discourse analysis, there's really two different types of discourse. There's discourse with a lowercase d, which is kind of a, a, a micro discourse uh, that signifies one-to-one uh, -one conversations or conversations that take place in small groups. So kind of this on-site is what G calls it, um, discourse. And so in a classroom setting, you're going to have a whole lot of this discourse going on with a lowercase d, where the teacher is speaking to students and students may be speaking back to teachers and students may be talking to each other and so forth. These are discourses with a lowercase d. Um, and so there are also discourses with a uh, uppercase d. And this concerns discourse at a larger macro level. Um, discourses that students will hear outside of an individual classroom. So they might hear it from TV, they might hear it in the malls, uh, other people talking, gossip, those kinds of things. What's important to understand about this is that in either, in either case, we're talking about verbal and nonverbal forms of discourse. So it's not just what people are saying, but also what they're doing, and it also has to do with the environment. So in a classroom, it not only has to do with what a, what a teacher is saying, but also the images that appear in a classroom. So if a teacher puts up posters, what are the messages that are being sent? Um, it, there may not be any discourse with a lowercase d going on about it, but there might be a larger discourse that's taking place. A message is being delivered by each and every poster that's put up, and the students are receiving that message. This is a larger, uh, 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 an uppercase D discourse that's going on. So we also have to be cognizant of, of the symbols uh, that are being used, uh, of the beliefs um, that are perhaps widespread in our, in our society and so forth. So teachers have to be cognizant of all of this. And it, it's, a, it's a load. There's a lot that we're asking teachers to be aware of. But if teachers don't work at it, I don't know how it is that they're going to become aware of these things. And so this is what equity literacy is asking us to do. For teachers to work at becoming aware of these discourses, whether it's a lowercase d or uppercase d, and how it is that they might either be reinforcing or battling against those things that students um, are bringing to the classroom that cause them to have uh, anxieties, stressors that ultimately affect their, uh, their schooling experience. Finally, um, Again, this is, it's very important to understand that discourses include everything that is said and unsaid. So if we don't say something about a particular content, that is a message as well. So whether teachers do or do not say something about a particular event, a particular concept, that message is, a message is being sent to the students. Now, some students will pick, on, pick up on that more than other students will. But we shouldn't be of the assumption that just because we're not saying anything, or just because we're not showing anything, that the message is not being sent. If the message is still being sent. I'm also going to be, oh, OK, so how does this look? Uh, this is a very simple way that I think teachers uh, in the classroom can try to understand how it is that bias in materials as a discursive event as with an uppercase D might have an effect, again, whether said or unsaid, on what's going on in the classroom. On the left-hand side uh, are results from a study that Christine Sleeter did uh, 
from, uh, where's, where's she's at? California, Monterey Bay, I think. Uh, she's Professor Emeritus there now, I think. Anyway, so several years ago, in 2002, she published this work where she studied the, what is called the California Public Schools History Social Sciences Framework. And it's kind of a curriculum guide, if you will, uh, that California was using. Again, this would have been probably late 1990s when she was, uh, pulling this from and then and published it in 2002. But as you can see, what she did is she looked at all the names that appeared in the curriculum for uh, U.S. history, and this is at a high school level, and she counted, simply counted, the number of people and placed them in categories according to uh, race, ethnicity. And as you can see, uh, 74 out of the 96 uh, were white uh, or Euro-Americans, 17 or 18 percent of the 96 uh, or African American. Native Americans represented 4% of the people in that curriculum. Latinx people um, in, in California uh, talking a lot about Mexican ethics, especially in Southern California. There was only one person uh, of Latino uh, background that appeared in the California Public Works uh, framework and none uh, from the Asian American community. So I wanted to know, you know, can, can are we seeing the same things locally? So in, in 2013, I was able to publish a piece that examined uh, the 2011-2012 school year U.S. history curriculum map from TUSD. And in that map, there were 49 total names that were offered for teachers to present to their students for study. Of those 49, 45 were Euro-Americans or white folks. So 92% What's probably even more telling is that in a place like Tucson, there were no Latinos and no Native Americans presented in the curriculum map for study. So if a teacher is, is going by this curriculum map to help him or her decide what to present in the classroom, and they're strictly going by the curriculum map, then Latinos and Native Americans and Asian Americans will never appear. There will be no individuals that will be talked about. Um, and so it seems to me that this is a simple way for teachers to be able to try to understand whether or not what it is that they are being directed to do by their districts or schools or state is inclusive. And if it's not, what can they do to address it? So again, in equity literacy, one of the things that uh, Gorski is asking us to do is to redress these problems. Again, I'm not going to go over that today. You know, at this point, we can leave it up to the teachers to decide how it is that they're going to offer redress. But this is one way that teachers, a simple way that teachers can recognize how it is that absence of inclusionary curriculum um, is, 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 is being forwarded in our, in our schools. So if, if we go into the classroom and we're doing a, an observation, for example, one of the things that we might ask our teachers to do is to look at a curriculum map from their district. Have they seen it? And if so, have they examined it? And this might be a simple way for them to be able to identify whether or not, number one, they, they are following uh, the curriculum map, and if so, is it inclusive or exclusive? And if, if it's exclusive, then how is it that they can uh, present some of uh, the absent groups uh, for study in their, in their classrooms? So I want to talk a little bit more about then classroom interactions. Again, there, there are two ways that Gorski talks about uh, in terms of this um, uh, equity literacy and the ways that we need to understand it. One way was through bias um, in uh, materials. Another way is through classroom interactions. So how is it that what teachers do, not necessarily what they're presenting for study, but what they do pedagogically, um, that we can identify as either contributing or, or, or addressing uh, the needs of, of students that are having uh, issues with, uh, with stress and, and so forth. Uh, several years ago, um, there was an article that was published by Leonardo and Porter. Um, in this piece, um, the authors talk about what they call a pedagogy of fear. What they found is that when it comes to having discussions, again, about race and ethnicity in this case, that teachers often avoid such discussions. And the reason why 
is that there is kind of this fear, thus the pedagogy of fear, that there's going to be emotional discomfort if they do so. And I think we've all run across that um, in, in not just schooling, but perhaps in everyday life. When we try to have conversations about race or ethnicity, often there is this tension that's almost automatically built into those kinds of conversations. And so what we try to do, um, according to Leonardo, and I, I think this is true, is that oftentimes people that are presenting on this work try to create uh, safe spaces so that nobody feels this emotional discomfort, right? But what Leonardo and Porter talk about is that when this safe space is constructed, and, and they were, of course, looking at, at classrooms, there was this misrecognition that, unfortunately, there was already what they call violence in the lives of a lot of students that were in the classroom. In other words, there was already discomfort when the students walked into the classroom. And the teachers not going there because they felt that it would cause discomfort really didn't work out very well because a lot of their students were already feeling just un un uncomfortable, right? So there's these social, uh, larger social dynamics that teachers must be aware of. And, and it, you know, schooling and teaching is a political act. So we have to understand the ways that politics, the ways that social interactions, the ways that social discourses about people, not them as individuals, but the groups from which they come are described and the way that they are treated in policy and so forth. And the effects that it can have on students, right? So in the work that Leonardo and Porter uh, do, they just mention that teachers need to be aware of those things. They don't show any proof that students are actually feeling the effects of social policies or poli politics um, in the classroom. But what is true, and you can go more, is that the findings that Leonardo and Porter uh, described in their work were consistent with the findings by Levy, and that is that students are coming into the classroom with stressors, right? And that these stressors are having a negative impact on the outcomes, uh, on the outcomes for students. So to address this, um, Dr. Lopez and I, uh, several years ago, studied how it is that a public policy uh, impacts uh, Mexican ethnic students uh, in the classroom. Specifically, we were looking at SB 1070, Arizona's anti-immigration law that passed in 2010. And we wanted to know specifically what the effect on Mexican American students was. And the reason we wanted to know that specifically is because SB 1070 ostensibly was going to affect folks that were undocumented. Now, Mexican Americans are not undocumented. So Mexican American students, according to public discourse, should not really feel in danger. They're American citizens, nothing's going to happen to them, right? But we wanted to know, were they affected? Uh, and so this study that, um, that I conducted w was a mixed methods uh, study where there was a quantitative piece and a qualitative piece. And what you're looking at is the cover, go back just one second, is, is the uh, page one of the quantitative uh, piece of this. So. Um, we were going to, we tried to measure uh, student stress with respect to SB 1070 in terms of Mexican American students, and then we tried to associate that with their attachment to school and their grades. Okay. So simply, um, amongst a whole lot of other things, we found that, let me click it one more time, um, that the students in our, in our work, let me click it, yeah, um, showed that indeed they did perceive uh, discrimination. Um, in society. Now, there were two types, of dis two types of anxieties that the students were feeling. One had to do with this overall perception of discrimination, right? And the second, go ahead and click it one more time, has to do with stress directly related to SB 1070. Hmm. 
right? So we could take out SB 1070 and ask the students essentially what it was that Levy and her colleagues were asking, and that is, do you feel uh, discriminated against, and, you know, and 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 how does that affect your schooling? So what we're looking at here, and, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I won't take the time to talk about how standardized coefficients reflect this. But essentially what we're looking at is that there is an association between the stress that students feel, and again, this is in Tucson, right, where we, where we did this study. There is an association between the perceived discrimination that students feel and, and stress. So it essentially replicates the work that Levy and her colleagues were doing somewhere else. So students in Tucson, are feeling this kind of stress. So what does that mean? That means they're coming into our classroom with stress from their perception of discrimination in society. So we can't go into our classrooms with the, with, with the thinking that our students are somehow immune to this because they're not. The second thing is that SB 1070 is also causing stress on top of this perceived discrimination. Right, so it's kind of this double-barreled shotgun uh, blow to them, right? And then the third thing that we wanted to look at is, are all students equally familiar with SB 1070? And if so, how does that affect uh, their stress? And so what we found is that really what it comes down to is that students that were familiar with SB 1070 uh, were not as stressed as students that were not familiar with SB 1070. Now, when I say familiar, I'm talking about they understood the particulars of the law. Almost all the students had heard about it, but some students knew more about it than others. So students that felt very familiar with what 1070 was talking about didn't uh, display as much stress as those students that didn't know very much about it. So what does that tell the teacher? Well, it's probably a good idea for teachers to talk about it so that students understand what it's all about. And that can bring some comfort in terms of stress uh, negation, right? Um, so those are three of the findings that we found in the quantitative uh, piece of, of our work. Okay, so there was also a qualitative piece. And, and that qualitative piece has to do with, well, students, how does all of this affect you in the classroom? I wanted to know from the student voice uh, what the effect of, of, of all this is. So um, in the qualitative piece, um, I asked students about their experiences in terms of studying uh, immigration and within immigration SB 1070. So this work took place in, in social studies classrooms. And I was particularly interested, again, in understanding how uh, studying immigration and hopefully SB 1070 within that uh, would affect the students. And so. The hypothesis was, there was an assumption that I was making, is that the teachers were talking about this in, class, in the classroom. But what I came to find out is that the students said teachers didn't talk about it, right? So there was this uh, avoidance that students described uh, that teachers didn't talk about these things. And I think that fits very well with Levy's findings and, and Leonardo's findings that teachers do not want to go there for fear of creating uh, uncomfortable spaces, right? So there's a couple of things, that, and I think I there's some handouts that you have. There's a, a two-page passage uh, that I passed out. If, if you all want to take a look at that. Um, I have it, guys. This, sorry. Do you have those? Yes. Just a second, Rick. Sorry. <laughs> I was in another okay. meeting, and I forgot to pull them out when I got here. No, no, pro no problem. No problem. Um, and, I, and I wanted to pass this out because obviously it won't fit on a, on a slide. Um, it's a little bit too much. But I also wanted you to see this. Um, I'll read it over, and, and hopefully all of you will be able to follow along with it. Um, and it describes how it is that one student talks about the effects of this, of this avoidance of, of talking about these things. Do you and Douglas have this? Yeah, I, I know what that looks like, so you can use that one. No, we didn't have it. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, does everybody have it there now? Do, do you and Nogales have it? Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to so, send it to Douglas. Okay. Thank you. I'll give you a minute to do that. There you go. 
Did, do they have a laptop that they can see it on? Uh, and their phones? Ernesto, it's going to you. Okay. Do you have a phone? Yep. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me just read this over. Um, and I'll start it slowly so that uh, those in Douglas have a, a chance to pull it up. The perceptions that teachers avoid discussing SB 1070 to protect students' emotional distress is developed by Miguel. To begin, he describes the distress created by teachers not offering SB 1070 for study. So I, I was the researcher, so I asked, would you like to have the opportunity to talk about the issues created by that law, or would that be bothersome to you? Again, my assumption was that the teachers were talking about it. And he said, no, it's not that. It's more like it bothers me that we don't talk about it. And so I asked, well, what do you mean? Again, kind of caught me off guard a little bit that he's saying they don't even talk about it. And he says, I mean, it would be cool to be able to say what I feel, you know? For me again, then, it becomes clear that he is not protected by teachers' avoidance of SB 1070 discussions. Again, teachers may not want to talk about it for fear that it would cause discomfort. But Miguel is saying that he, w he wanted the opportunity to talk about it, and in some way that would have made him feel better. In addition, he believes that the protection of some students' emotional distress comes at the expense of other students. I asked him, why do you think it's not talked about in classes? And he said, I don't know. I mean, it's probably that they don't want to make anybody feel bad. But like I said, the funny thing is, it makes us feel bad that they don't say anything about all that stuff, you know? And so I asked, so it makes you feel bad? And he said, yeah, but the teachers probably don't want to make anybody feel bad, so they figure not saying anything is better. So Miguel is trying to give the teachers a way out of this. He's trying to say, you know, it's, I understand why they're not doing this. They don't want to bring discomfort to anybody. However, he's also saying, I already feel bad though, but you know, this is the way it goes. So I asked him, Better for who? Who would it be better for that teachers don't talk about this? And he says, well, I mean, I guess some students who are for it, it being the law. I mean, either way, someone is going to feel bad, right? So I don't know. I mean, we, really, we already feel bad, so might as well save somebody's feelings. Miguel suggests a zero-sum game wherein the protection of the emotional comfort of some students is foregone by protecting other students. So this then goes to the idea that it's not only what it is that is said in the classroom, it is also what is unsaid that teachers need to be aware of and, and reflect upon. So if teachers in any content area are avoiding uh, content that they feel could cause discomfort, then there needs to be reflection about whether or not that avoidance is beneficial to all students, or if some students are already feeling discomfort, that such discussions would somehow mediate and perhaps alleviate. Um, so I think it's important for, for our teachers then to be able to kind of go through this process of reflection upon what it is that is done and what is not done and trying to come to terms with the effects that those things have on the students in the classroom. So I'm going to close, we've got about 10 or 15 more minutes, but I'm going to close with this last example. Go ahead and, and click it one time. All right, so this is the kind of poster, again, I'm, I'm using social studies as, a, as an exemplar here, but this is the kind of poster that we might see under a um, diversity type of uh, situation where, where a teacher is trying to create diversity, trying to address issues multiculturally, um, and so forth. This kind of poster might be seen in a, social, in a social studies classroom, and I'm sure many of you have seen something similar to this. And, which is fine, and, and I'm, I'm not suggesting, nor I would, what I think Gorski would suggest, not to do this, not to put this poster up in the classroom. But perhaps the question that should be asked is for students to contemplate whether that quote is something that is actually true. 
in our society today. In other words, Martin Luther King talked about this as a dream. Has the dream been fulfilled? For example, might be a question that teachers would ask, rather than just putting the poster up and letting it sit there and doing nothing with it. Do the teachers at some point address it and address it in a way that students have a chance to critique what's being said and apply it to their thoughts about how it is they're experiencing society, right? And then there's a second poster that is possible for a teacher to put up. And this, I think, would have more of a direct impact on what we call equity literacy. Again, it's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr., but it's a quote that is, that is again, asking students if used properly, to really um, uh, examine the experiences that they have and the experiences that others have and the way that it might impact them in the classroom. So the quote, and I don't, you can't really see it very well because it's very small writing, uh, but it's a quote from his uh, letter from a Birmingham prison. And in it, he talks about, and I'll just read one small part of it. He says, um, the Negro's grand stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more de uh, who is more devoted to quote unquote order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension in a particular place, which is the presence of justice, who co who constantly say quote. I agree with you in the goal you've used, but I cannot agree with you in the methods of direct action. So this, again, is coming from the same person, but it's offering a much deeper analysis that will address, or could address, potentially, the experiences that, te that, that students bring that could cause them anxieties in the classroom, and an opportunity for them to be able to talk about it so that there can be at least an addressing of these anxieties for those students that are feeling it. Um, is this a cure-all? Is equity literacy a cure-all for students that come to the classroom with anxieties? And I would suggest that it's not. However, it is a way for teachers to show that they support students and the experiences that they might be uh, going through, uh, not just in our classrooms, but in larger societies. And that includes in the hallways right outside the classrooms, in their school sites, in their districts, in their neighborhoods, and so on and so on. Uh, I think we've all been under, we've all heard about how it is, if we're feeling bad about something, let's talk about it and let's air it out so that we can find some way to feel better about things. Well, this is precisely what equity literacy is asking us to do. It's asking us to give the students a chance to talk about those things that are potentially causing problems for them that lead to the outcomes that I spoke to earlier. So at this point, what I wanted to do is, is, is leave the last several minutes for questions, and then and this will be before we go to our 2 o'clock meeting, right, uh, to talk about the um, assessment in the classroom, right? So. I'm, I'm willing to entertain. Oh, uh, I, uh, I'm willing to entertain questions. Oh, no, no, okay. Thank you all for coming today. Hey, hey, we have questions. <laughs> I know. Hey, I know. We okay. have questions. I have one question. Do you have questions? I do have questions. Okay. You go first. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Rick. Um, and I really, really appreciated uh, your uh, your presentation. Um, can you share the PowerPoint with the faculty forum? Sure. And the other question I have. Um, what what do you re recommend? What what path of actions do you recommend for us as faculty and staff um, to implement in our daily work life? What we what what can we address um, right away? Um, Develop LCE program. Mm -hmm. And Curtis is sitting here, so uh, I'm sure. That, but but the reason I say that is because I think. A program like his will offer, at least to the students in his, in his program, but then we can sp uh, speak to how it is that we can mm -hmm. talk about this as, as a larger faculty at, at U of A South. But it seems to me like that's a perfect place to be able to, uh, to address these kinds of things, right? Um, language, culture, and education, 
what, what is the cultural part that I think is missing from a lot of the work that we do. And again, maybe we can expand it now to uh, Juve South as, as a whole. But I think we're, we're missing a lot of the ways that, and I'm, I'm going to say culture right now, the ways that culture is either examined or left unexamined by our college. But Absolutely. it's more than just it's more than just an examination of culture. Again, this is where, where equity literacy comes in. That is that if we're going to make an impact on the experiences of students, not just in K-12 classrooms, but perhaps even for our students at U of A South and at the university as a whole, for us to be able to have a larger impact, we're going to have to have study that, as Curtis called it before, is brave rather than safe. Uh, because if we go to the safe place, then what that's going to mean for a lot of folks is that we don't go there. We don't have the conversations because it's not safe and it's uncomfortable. But we have to have the courage to be able to talk about these things because they do exist and, and there's not only is there biological consequences to what's going on, there's psychological consequences, and then there's behavioral consequences as well. And the behavioral consequences are those things that students demonstrate in the classroom. So not engaging in school, uh, not continuing in school, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are important, but they don't get addressed simply by addressing culture, because too often that is co-opted into studies of heroes and holidays, for example. Uh, so th there's a lar much larger examination that needs to take place that maybe we can call it a sociological examination. I I'm not sure. But it's a much larger examination than what culture by itself offers. Now, that doesn't mean we should, again, we shouldn't go to studying culture. We need to do that. But we can't stop at that. We, we need to take that and talk about the conditions that create the environment so such that we haven't talked about those things when we've talked about culture in the past. So, for example, in the Mexican American Studies program at TUSD, they were talking about culture quite a bit. But they were also talking about the ways that the students' environments were having an effect on them. And the ways that the students could contest that environment so that it would result in improvements in their educational experience. So they wanted students to examine their schools. They wanted the students to examine their communities. They wanted the students to examine politics. They wanted their students to examine discourse and so forth so that the students would have a better idea about the things that are important to them and why those things are happening and if it's having a negative impact on them, how it is that they can take action on an individual level and as a group to address those things and to, and to find a way uh, uh, to alleviate those problems. So, but that's not going to happen if the students aren't given the opportunity to investigate and have those kinds of questions. So whether we're talking about K-12 or, or higher ed, it seems to me um, that students need to have those same kind of, of opportunities. I could add, add one note. Get in front of the camera, probably. Uh, if, if, you know, build, building off of what, and can they see me? I don't know, can you see him? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, barely. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, building off of what Rick said as far as, like, what can our college do, um, what I'm finding, um, what I'm finding in other spaces right now um, is, uh, for instance, when, I, when I'm working with school districts, is we very seldom uh, center this work. It's very much marginalized. And the research that's coming out, not only Rick's and Francesca's, and the research that they cite as well, but also the research we used in, you know, uh, to, to a great effect um, to win the court case this summer against the state of Arizona, um, the, the research says this work should be at the Senate. Um, you know, that's when transformation happens. And so, um, you know, in our own discourse, in our faculty forum, you know, like the diversity meeting is when is that one diversity meeting rather than diversity is in every meeting. Uh, we're talking about what's going on to our students. 
uh, it, you know, Edda brought up the DACA students, uh, you know, our, our DACA students today, and it was, it's a side piece to, an, uh, to, to the agenda. Um, and I think that goes back to, to these ideas of safe space. I think that's really, really awesome that you, you found that, um, literature, that, that in the literature, because um, safe for whom? So if I can use my personal example, we, we created a safe space for all our students, um, and, and, but it wasn't, it was a threatening space, this is Mexican American Studies, to the, 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 some big time actors in state government in this, in this, you know, in, our, in Arizona. You know, so, so we have to interrogate safe for whom? And what does that mean? Um, so a lot of times the work that Rick is, is talking about, the work that, 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 that the three of us that spoke this, this series, spoke about is threatening to some folks. So we have to interrogate why is that? Why are we threatened by that? So I was funny, I was just looking up in my critical sustaining pedagogies uh, book right now, like a colleague of ours is real dear to us, uh, Dr. Lee Patel calls them um, safe truth spaces. And then another colleague is using that to talk about indigenous and Native American um, uh, sacred Spaces. So there's a lot of us having this conversation right now, which is really interesting because, um, you know, with, the, with this last, with this last, um, I think the words of King are really important here because we're finding, you know, from Birmingham Jail, we're, we're finding teachers all over, and the larger big D, big D discourse of our country is having a hard time with with a quarterback hitting a knee over a year ago, who now is blackballed from the NFL, and it's lit something on fire, um, you know, so it becomes, you know, and before that, Ferguson, and before that, Mexican American Studies, and before that, you know, bilingual education under attack. We've seen this happen time and again, um, where, uh, where the discomfort of inequity and inequality the, the the response to that is shut up. Let's silence it at all costs, or or retreat to politeness, um, retreat re retreat to niceties. And there's some of this stuff that that is very ugly uh, when we talk about in inequality. One of the things I've been saying lately, I'll close here. Um, I've been talking. I've been using the transcript of the trial and and, and the, myself as a witness pieces of it. Um, and the ruling from Judge Tashima and, and lately, and I still haven't gotten it all, I, it's still not very polished, but what it's come to, what's brought to the forefront is our lives are contested at every moment. Our breaths are contested, our lives are contested, even our deaths are contested. And if we think about that for our community, for our brothers and sisters that live in this country, that's a heavy burden for all of us to carry, to know that our fellow citizens, our children, are living contested lives every second of the day. If we retreat from that, we're doing the exact opposite of what Rick's whole talk was about. We're reinforcing the alienation and contributing to the failure and the broken dreams of those students. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, I loved how sweet Miguel was uh, by giving the teachers the benefit of the doubt in his analysis of why there was no discussion of SB 1070 at school. Um, I, I don't think that, I don't think that that's how I would read what happens in school around the discussion, and we'll just take SB 1070 as a good example. To me, one of the problems that I see with our students is that we have a healthy number of students who actively don't care about the news, don't follow the news, and don't follow it thinking about who their students are and how taking the knee, for example, or new legislation on DACA students, they don't, we don't ever have an opportunity to work with our students about contemporary issues that impact their students very differently than we as educators may be impacted by those events. And so I think that's one of the things that really struck me about that passage from your interview with Miguel, is that what's our responsibility for helping Miguel's teacher, first of all, understand some legislation that that teacher may not have understood or paid attention to, 
because we all sort of now are, live in our own little new silo. So anyway, I, I think there's I think there's a piece there that's really important for us, and that's how do we deal with contemporary news with our students so they can deal with contemporary news with their students. I, I think Gorski would, would argue that that's precisely what he wants equity literacy to do. Good. I'm yeah. there. I have, I have a comment, actually. Um, the first time that you um, exposed me, if you will, to your to your findings, I, it just, it really shook me. It really did, um, the way you spoke about being open in the classroom and um, at the same time, continuously, uh, the diversity office on main campus was working on Voices of Discovery, which you and I met with Dr. Trevino on. Um, so what I decided to do as an action with my class at Cochise College, I decided to just change my, my curriculum completely and include at least once a month, I think that's, it's coming now to that because we're so busy, but at least once a month or twice a month, a uh, space into where we talk about controversial topics, period. You know, so what I actually did something very simple, we looked up controversial topics, have a list, we have a, a little cup where uh, students get to draw from that cup and whatever topic comes up, we tackle it together as, as, a, as a class. And it's very interesting, actually, their, their feedback, how they feel, how they're passionate about certain topics. And, and I really do think that us doing that has really changed their life and their perspective as to what higher education is. Um, Thank you. Where do they go from there? They go to the master's program at U of A. They go into LCE. They go into LCE. Thank you. 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 Oh, Go ahead. You're, you're talking about students at Cochise College, right? Yes, right. Yeah. Would you have any reason to believe that students at, at a high school in a secondary level would react any differently? I don't think they would react any differently. I think it would be important to do that at that stage of their education as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the, the teachers at that level would react differently. Um, <laughs> well, and it is part of the standards for the English, by school English. I love you. <laughs> um, hopefully the when they leave our program, they're not acting any differently. But um, yeah, so thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. There was another question? Maybe one more question? Well, I, I have one. Question. So uh, through conversation with a friend who's an elementary teacher, uh, third grade, one of the conversations that did come up was about DACA, that the teacher didn't feel knowledgeable enough to go there, and I think that's maybe a misunderstanding, misconception, misnomer, whatever you want to call it, that we as teachers feel we need to come with all the knowledge. So how do we equip our teachers to be comfortable in the I don't know zone and, and allow them to discover through discussion with the, how do they guide that? Well, I, I don't know how you make people feel comfortable with gaining knowledge. Hmm. Um, and if you're a teacher, I'm not sure, and, and I don't want to criticize your friend. I'll tell her. But how is it, <laughs> if, if, a teacher is, if, if a teacher is uncomfortable about the notion of gaining understanding, mm -hmm. Uh, then, then we've got some real issues right. and <laughs> and that, think, that, that think, perhaps are beyond equity literacy. Yeah, but, thank you. So uh, I think, yeah. No, yeah, but I think more she was concerned of offending or not to. So it's that avoidance right. through. Right. So, so again, you know, teachers, this is a difficult job, and but but part of this job is to not stop learning, right? So we. As teachers, we need to be um, informed about all of these things, um, and, and especially now that there's there's evidence showing that our students are aware, and it's having an impact. Now, they may not be able to uh, to talk about the issues the way that we might be able to, but they're certainly aware of the issues, and they're impacted by those things. 
And so I, it would seem to me that if, you know, if there's an authentic caring uh, on the part of the teachers, that they would want to take the time <laughs> to be able to inform themselves about that which might, even if they don't care, they would want to know about the things that, are, that, that our students are caring about, right? And the impact that it could have on them. So I, I don't know how else to say it. It seems to me that at some point teachers, hopefully, and I, and I think this is probably usually the case, are inquisitive about things. Um, and I think what we need to let them know is it's okay uh, to talk about the things that they are inquisitive about. Because their students are social beings as well. Mm -hmm. And they're hearing it, mm -hmm. too. So if we're going throughout the day not acting like it's not something that doesn't that, 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 that exists, then we're kind of asking, you know, asking them to pull the wool over their eyes. And we're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. Right. But it's still having an impact on them. Whether we pull the wool over their eyes or not, they're still going to be impacted by it because of the social disorder, the, the uppercase D, right? They're still subject to all of that. And so I, it, I think it's important that um, teachers be aware of these things. Because again, it could have, it, it could be the reason why students are behaving the way that they're behaving in class. I'm not saying it definitely is in every single case, but it's possible that they are reacting to circumstances that are happening, perhaps not even in our classroom. Um, that are happening outside of our classroom. But if we're not talking about it in our classroom, then our, the question is, are we contributing to that, to that anxiety that the student is feeling? Or at the very least, are we not offering them a avenue to be able to somehow relieve some of that anxiety, right through understanding, right? Rick, can I say something more about that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I just sorry. wanted to add, if we're talking about discourse, we have to make sure that the discourse is not just happening with our students, but it's also happening amongst ourselves. And, and that we provide the platform to be able to do that. Because speaking about DACA, if you are talking to people around you in your, in your um, surroundings, if you will, like for example in Douglas, NACO for us, and, and all of those areas, students are afraid to say and, that they're DACA students. They're, they're, they won't come out in the open and say that. So for a teacher to even open that topic, it's very delicate because they're not open to it. So to have the discourse amongst us, professionals, you know, the teachers, the administrators, it starts there. Because then you're able to find out that if it does come up or you do have to tackle that subject with them, you've already prepared yourself with enough tools to be able to to take care of it. So for example, and I'm just gonna put this on the table, I don't know how many of you guys know, but the governments like Mexico, they're offering tons of incentives to those DACA students to go back to Mexico. Um, free tuition, not having to uh, complete um, exams, placement exams at the university. I'm looking at Maru here because her university in Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco, they're doing an amazing job in getting these DACA students back. So, so that our students feel like, okay, maybe it's my end here in the U.S., maybe it's not, but I have choices. I have choices, so, so having right. that conversation have, is important. Yeah, we, we have our work cut out for us because not only yeah. is it a question of whether we should do this kind of work, but it's also a question for our teachers of how do they do this kind of work. So we want them to talk about it, but there's, a, there, but there's an art to doing it. Right. So, and I think that's probably what you're talking about, Melissa. So, yes. so we have our, our we have our work cut out for us, um, at a, in, in 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 this in this in this realm, right? Um, and certainly, we're not going to get it done in one semester. We may not be able to get it done in one year. But I think if we continue to work on it, and and it's and it's something that is having the impact that I'm I'm hoping that it'll have, then then eventually it, it'll find its way, and students, uh, our students will learn not only about how to deal with it um, in a scientific manner, but also how to deal with it arti artistically, right? So how is it that we talk about DACA without making our students feel bad in the conversation, right? Again, it's this feeling bad business, right? This, but we certainly can't run from it. 
um, because it, it's real and it does exist and it does cause anxieties. Yeah, you know, I mean, this discussion is making me think like if a, if a therapist heard like a family going through this stuff, they'd call it dysfunctional communication, right? Like if there's things going on in, in your relationship or in the world that is affecting your family and your, your or your or your, your your partner or whatever, you're supposed to bring that stuff out. So it's, it's suppressing our humanity by by having this like this false uh, sense of safety. of safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or unbiased. Which is crazy. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Anybody else? I, I think our time is probably up. We need to get to the other part now, right? Yes. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, the next part of our meeting is for our university mentors that work directly with our fast track students and our alternative pathway students. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, it's really crazy. I'm, I'm home for two weeks. Okay. Sorry. I'm stepping all over here. Oh, Maria? 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 I sent him to um, Yes. Do is there? Um, what would you like to do about recording this portion? Do you we think don't have to record this part. No, we don't have to record this portion. Thank you.